<laughs> and I did not, so thank you. Thank you again to Greg and to Beth for, for guiding us into worship and through worship. The uh, prelude today is Gracious God for Every Blessing. I hope as we gather together and the Holy Spirit calls us together as people of God that we felt that joy in Henry's heart as he saw Nana. Uh, may we also come to God with such love and joy and excitement. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the fountain of living water, the rock who gave us birth, our light and our salvation. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Please join me. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you and your beloved children. We have turned our faces away from your glory when it did not appear as we expected. We have rejected your word when it made us confront ourselves. We have failed to show hospitality to those you called us to welcome. Accept our repentance for the things we have done 
and the things we have left undone. For the sake of Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us and lead us that we may bathe in the glory of your Son, born among us, and reflect your love for all creation. Amen. And a word of blessing and forgiveness. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace, we have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. May Almighty God strengthen us with power through the Holy Spirit that Christ may live in our hearts through faith. Amen. Take a moment and appreciate that remarkable, beautiful gift. The hymn is 326. I think, Joan, you have a hymnal there at home, 326 in the Red Evangelical Lutheran Worship. Bless now, O God, the journey. We're singing verses 1 and 2. Tim for today. I appreciated that the trail was found in the dessert. Also, there's, there's always good news snuck in uh, to our worship service. God is wonderful at that. Please join me as we pray the Kyrie. Kyrie means Lord have mercy. We pray for mercy from our Lord. If you are struggling to lose weight and secretly want to escape from the prison of fat, then you have to see this now. <laughs> That's a trail through the dessert. <laughs> Lord have mercy. <laughs> In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all. Let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. The Lord be with you. Let us pray together. The prayer can be found on your celebrate insert if you have that. 
or on the screen. If you can't see either, please pray along in your heart. Oh, Lord God, you led your people through the wilderness and brought them to the promised land. Guide us now so that following your son, we may walk safely through the wilderness of this world toward the life you alone can give through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. God speaks to us in scripture reading, preaching, and the song as part of our service is based upon this word. The first reading is from Deuteronomy 26. I don't think, I didn't pick a, a reader for today. Am I stepping on anyone's toes if I read the lesson? Oh, go ahead, Chris. Thank you. Great, that's all set up for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. You've heard me in the end of chapter 31. When you have come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance to possess, and possess it and settle in it, you shall take some of the first of all the fruit of the ground which you harvest from the land that the Lord your God is giving you. And you shall put it in a basket and go to the place that the Lord your God will choose as a dwelling for his name. You shall go to the priest who is in the office at that time and say to him, Today I declare to the Lord your God that I have come into the land that the Lord swore to our ancestors to give us. And the priest takes the basket from your hand and sets it down before the altar of the Lord your God. We shall make this response for the Lord your God. A wandering Aramean was my ancestor. He was bound into Egypt and lived there as an enemy, few in number, and there became a great nation, mighty and populous. When the Egyptians treated us harshly and afflicted us by opposing hard labor on us, we cried to the Lord, the God of our ancestors. The Lord heard our voice and saw our affliction, our toil, and our oppression. The Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched storm, with a terrifying display of power and with signs and wonders. And he brought us into this place and gave us this land, a land of flowers, milk, and honey. Now I bring the first of the fruit of the ground that you, O Lord, have given me. You shall set it down to the Lord your God and bow down to the Lord your God. And you, together with the Levites and the Aliens who reside among you, shall celebrate with all the value the Lord your God has given to you and to your house. The Lord your God. Amen. We respond to Psalm 91. You who dwell in the shadow of the Most High, who abide in the shadow of the Almighty. To say to the Lord, my refuge and my stronghold, my God in whom I put my trust. Because you have made the Lord your refuge and most high in your habitation. For God will give the angels charge of you to guard you in all your ways. Upon their hands they will bear you. As you strike your foot against us, you will tread upon the lion, cub, and the viper, you will trample down the lion and the serpent. I will deliver those who cling to me. I will uphold them because they know me. They will call me and I will answer them. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue and honor them. With long life will I satisfy them and show them my salvation. Second reading is from the tenth chapter of Romans. The word is near you and is rich in your heart. That is the word of faith to be proclaimed. Because if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For one believes with the heart and is so justified, and one confesses with the mouth and so is saved. The scripture says, No one who believes in him will be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all, and is generous to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the Lord shall be saved. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you for bringing the word to us, Chris. Holy Gospel is from the fourth chapter of Luke, beginning at the first verse. 
Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan after his baptism and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing at all during these days, and when they were over, he was famished. The devil said to Jesus, if you are the Son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. Jesus answered him, it is written, one does not live by bread alone. When the devil led him up and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world, and the devil said to Jesus, to you, I will give their glory and all this authority, for it has been given over to me, and I give it to anyone I please. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered the devil, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil took Jesus to Jerusalem and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to protect you, and on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus answered the devil, it is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished every test, he departed from Jesus until an opportune time. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Jesus has a way of turning things upside down for this Lenten season. Uh, the message that normally is geared towards adults will be first, and the message that is normally geared towards uh, younger ones will be the center of our sermons. So that is going to be um, from a wonderful book called Tell Me a Story, 30 Children's Sermons. They're based on children's books. So I'll be sharing little bits of children's books um, through the season of Lent. Um, but first we learn about holding on to the word. Before we do that, I'm going to invite, we have some, some younger people in the congregation today, and I'm going to invite you guys to come up because we have a little bit of a puzzle uh, to do here in this season of Lent. I'm wondering if you guys would like to come up. You're welcome to do so. Grayson, if you want to come up, you can. And Mark and Charlotte and Henry. Nice to be with you. How's it going, guys? Good. You can take a knee if you want. You can sit down if you want. You can see I have all sorts of good stuff over here. And Mark Henry wants to talk with uh, lighting of the candles. What was that like for you? It was almost like a birthday. Yeah. Oh, what a great way to put it. Like a birthday. Happy birthday. Is it your birthday? Yeah. Oh, is it? It's, it's, on, it's, it's on November. Yeah. November. November. That's a good one. It'll Number. come eventually. And Charlie, your birthday is in December. Remember that? And Mark, you just had your birthday. Right? What's your birthday, Grace? Um, I forget. You forget. We should celebrate it every day, though. What do you think? I'm happy with your life. not every day, though. No? Can we celebrate through your life every day? It's a big question. Well, I'll celebrate today. I'm happy with your life. You did. I see your Cheerios, your specials, and look at this. Can anybody tell me what shape this is? I know. I know. It's... It's, it's like the church symbol. It is yeah. like the church symbol. Excellent. What else do you know about it? It's a cross. It's a cross. Excellent. And we're going to talk about why the cross is a church symbol. Do you know, Charlie? Is it okay if I call you Charlie or you want to be called Charlie? Charlie? Okay. Yeah. I've been listening to your mom. I'm going to call you Charlie. Hi. Thank you. What else are you going to say, Rosie? It looks like an angel. It looks like an angel. Excellent. Oh, you guys are amazing. And there are pieces of a puzzle that we're going to do just one at a time. It's a little tricky to see this. This one's going to go right in the middle. So, Charlotte, I'm going to ask you to put this puzzle piece right in the middle of the puzzle. Grace, I'm going to ask you. Get a little tape and tape it on there. Pull it out of the heart. And if we're lucky, we're going to get your fingers stuck in there too, though. 
eyes, and one letter in the middle of it. Oh. oh. There are going to be words on here every week, every Sunday. We're going to add letters on this puzzle. Wait, hang on. From right down here, that maybe does not say hallelujah? Oh, oh, that's a good guess. We'll find out as we go. That's an excellent because it Because in hallelujah, maybe there's an O in there. Maybe there's an O in there. We'll check when we take it back from the box. On Easter. Excellent. Excellent. So good job with the puzzle. And thank you. We'll keep talking about the cross and what Jesus does on the cross for us. But in the meantime, I'm going to give this. Uh, we have ones for people that do read, which is you guys. So this one. And this one. And Charlotte, I bet that you are reading, but you also like to do pictures. Would you like one with pictures? It is a little upside down because sometimes I make mistakes. You ever make mistakes? No. Yeah. Oh, goodness. But that's correct. Enough. It is. One's upside down, one's right side up. And we're going to talk about what happens with mistakes. That's going to come up the story that we'll see a little bit later on. So, what I'm going to do. Yeah. I'm going to give you this one. And I'm going to ask you guys to share this one. And Henry, this one's for you. You guys can go back. Yeah, let's, let's go back. Let's go back. You're back. Thank you for Cheerios. Thank you for pictures. Thank you for crosses that look like angels. Thank you for Grace and God. Thank you for Mark, God. Thank you for Charlotte, God. Thank you for Henry, God. And thank you for all the different people that you bring together to make your family. Continue to be with us as we walk through life. All right. So yeah. come on up, you guys can get your seats. As you probably heard, I made a mistake. Did you notice that part of the uh, paper for the kids part was right side up and the other part was upside down? And I hope you don't get dizzy trying to figure it out. Any of the rest of you ever made a mistake? Uh, this is your aerobics. Remember, I almost always ask a question that everybody can practice your aerobics with. I imagine some of us have made mistakes and sometimes they're pretty big. In fact, there's a lot of mistakes being made in the world today. Some of them by me, some of them by you, some by things we have done, some by things we have not done. There are things globally that look like pretty huge mistakes. Uh, we have some Ukrainian colors here that Carol has knitted into prayer shawls. What a beautiful way to be able to pray together. It seems like uh, fighting one another uh, can be a huge mistake, a painful one. Sometimes we're able to come back and to clean up our mistakes, and sometimes we're not. Sometimes the consequences of our mistakes are things that cannot be undone. Sometimes we're afraid of trying stuff because we might make a mistake. We might fall. We might get hurt. We might look silly. I heard a great quote yesterday. I was listening to a show on the radio, and a person who had been on television in one of those reality shows uh, pointed out that when she was on the reality show, she blurted out that she thought there were 265 days in a year. <laughs> close. She's only 100 off. It was close. Uh, but she was a little embarrassed that everybody watching that show had heard that she didn't know how many days were in a year. She also said, I also pointed out that stupid is spelled with two O's and not one. <laughs> yeah, I'll say it one more time. 
<laughs> yeah, they're no O's and stupid, but it does sound that way and it's very tricky. So we make mistakes. Sometimes we get fed up with the situations that we're in and we go to the word of God to hold on tight, either because we just don't know where else to go or there's no way back from where we are or we're not quite sure where we're going. In all those circumstances, we hold on tight to the word of God. Not long ago in, in the hospital where I work, there was a patient who was pretty fed up with being a patient. In fact, I would say they lost their patience and wanted to be a patient no more. So they decided, even though they weren't quite healed up and they weren't quite ready to go out in the world, they took their hospital gown, all flappy in the back and everything, and decided to go out and leave. Well, uh, folks had to search a little bit. So where do you think they went to search? Where would someone who wants to leave go? Yeah, they try and go home. So where would the, they would head to an exit? This person did not go to the exit. We thought maybe they were hungry. Where would they go if they were hungry? Sure, to the cafeteria. We checked. No. Maybe they were trying to hide, so we checked the laundry. No. Maybe they got lost, which happens. And so we looked all around the hallways. No. Can you imagine where this person was? Oh, you guys know me so well. <laughs> they were. This is a true story. They were in the chapel. Not knowing where else to go. Being totally fed up being entirely frustrated with this whole healing process, with being stuck in a place or a position that you really don't have control over, they went to the chapel. They needed the word of God. They were praying. And you know where they went? They went to Psalm 91 that we had today. That's what they were praying. That's what they were holding on to. And interestingly, the only way that they were able to get talked to going back into their room for continued care was to literally hold the word of God. They ripped the page right out of the Bible. Now, as a little footnote for people that are librarians and love, love books and all that, uh, we do give Bibles out when people ask. You don't have to rip a page out. I don't recommend ripping, ripping a page out, but I do recommend holding the word of God that closely to our hearts and to our minds and to our hands and in our lives. But a beautiful reality to recognize that God is present in God's word, in God's family as we're together, whether we're virtual or in person. God's word is with us on our lips and in our hearts. God's word is with, is with us as we confess our belief in Jesus Christ, the one who went to the cross for us. And Charlotte, that's a little insight and grace, and that's a little clue. Jesus went to the cross. That's why that's a symbol of our faith. Jesus was willing to take our sins to the cross, to bury them, and to give us a promise of new life. That's a word to hold on to, especially when things are bumpy, not exactly the way that we want them. So hold on to that word of God as we hear the story that is the main message for today. Well, Greg is queuing that up. It's called... What if zebras lost their stripes? It's written by John Raitano and illustrated by William Haynes. I'll just ask you a question. If zebras lost their stripes, what color would they be? Not quite yet, Greg. It's a story, it's a link on the, on the sermon page. It is a good song and it goes great after the story. Oh, maybe it does not. I'll tell you what, I can share my screen. I have it on my grade, do you want me just to play it? Okay. My bad. What if 
The Zebras Lost Their Stripes by John Ritano, illustrated by William Haynes. What if the zebras lost their stripes? And some lost black, and some lost white. Would they think that it's all right? Or would the zebras start to fight? Would there be separate zebra types if the zebras lost their stripes? Would different colors be the end of living life as loving friends? Would zebras see themselves as zebras? Or would their colors make them start to only see the black or white and not what lives within their hearts? Would there be separate zebra lands? Could black and white friends still hold hands? Would zebra children be okay to join together, laugh, and play? I know why God gave zebras stripes, so that there'd be no black or white. But zebras would be much too smart to let their colors tear them apart. That's the message for us today. We'll hold on to the word of God to not be ripped apart by differences, but recognize that we are unified and not uniform. Jesus was not ripped apart by temptation, and neither shall we be as we continue. We'll hold on to the word, hold on to his promise, and continue to follow it. Let us pray. Let the words of our hearts, our mouths, meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for Lord our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The hymn that follows is If You But Trust in God to Guide You. It's Evangelical Lutheran Worship 769, M769, if you but trust in God to guide you. Verses 1 and 2. Please join me as together we profess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. 
He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. As we join in prayer, we recognize that there is war going on in the world, and we're reminded to be instruments of peace, but where there is hatred, to sow love. We pray for the church. Sharpen its proclamation of the word so that your people learn to reject voices of deception and distraction. Strengthen all who are tempted to believe lies about themselves or others. We pray together. Merciful God, receive our prayer. We pray for the earth and all its creatures. Protect wilderness places and all plant and animal species that call them home. Sustain farmers and all laborers who work the land and harvest the fruits of its abundance. We pray together. Merciful God, receive our prayer. We pray for the nations of the world. Awaken elected leaders and government officials to the needs of those who are oppressed and grant the compassion to deal mercifully with immigrants and refugees who reside among us. We pray together. Merciful God, receive our prayer. We pray for all in need. Rescue those experiencing mental illness or contending with addiction. Ease the anxiety of those who live with dementia. Command your angels concerning all who are sick, especially those we name in our hearts and out loud at this time. For those preparing for surgery and those healing from surgery and hospitalization, for those that are sick and tired of being sick and tired, we pray for Laura, Pat, as she goes in for surgery this week, for Wendy and Roy, for Inga, June and Susie, for Paul, Amber, Jerry, and Joni. We pray for those with chronic conditions, including Linda, SD, FI, Joe, John, Alice June, Debbie, Bambi, Paul, and Mark, Virginia, Linda, AJ, and Sophia, for Nina, Rick, Angie, Debbie, for Bob, Elaine, Sandy, and Bill, for Max and Betty, for Jake, Darlene, for Gary and Ann, for Anna, Zoe, Amy, and Gina, for Ron and Barbara, for John, Soka, and Hong as she continues her treatments, for Bill and Janice, for Pauline and Mike, for Norman, Kathleen, for Mike S., for Tucker, for Chuck, and Carol. Receive our prayers for the 441 million people who have been and are afflicted with COVID, for people that are in hospice and comfort care, including Faye, Shirley, Earl, Darlene, Nancy, and Evelyn. We pray for others whose needs are known to you, for Adam, Tyler, and Bernadette, for Ralph and Paul, for Sue, Carl, Linda, for Tina and the full family, for Sabrina, Bill, and Laura, for Benita and Kenita, for Brian and Kathy, for Mike, Shirley, and Richard, for Rachel, for all in the militaries, including Lily, for all involved in Ukraine, the United Nations, the Russian military, and support actions. And Lord, we pray in thanksgiving that you gather in those who have died. Especially today, we remember our brother John. We thank you for gathering him along with the six million people that have died of COVID. Those who died in other ways. Those for whom we remember anniversaries, birthdays, and death days. For those who died and fallen victim of human-caused and natural disasters. Lord, gather them with all the saints into your heavenly dwelling place. Comfort and bring consolation and care from all those around those who are grieving. Encourage us with the promise that all who call upon your name are saved. We pray together, merciful God, receive our prayer. Lord God, thank you for healing, for the healing of Elaine G and Nancy, Amber and Elaine N, the healing of Bobby and Joni, Rebecca T and Anna of Tammy, who goes back to work this week, of Jim and Susie, of Bobby, for Kevin and Jay, Earl, Anthony, and Duke. We thank you for recovery from COVID for Rachel D. Lord God, we thank you for celebration, for joys in our family of faith, for the unified international competition of the Olympics and now the Paralympics, for being together in person and virtually for worship. We 
We thank you for Chuck and Carol's anniversary. We thank you for the birthdays of Courtney, Carl, and Stacy, of Howard, Ruth, and Darlene, of Ken and Olani and Doug. Lord God, for all these that are spoken and the countless prayers that are unspoken, accept the prayers that we bring, O oh God, on behalf of a world in need, behalf of a world thankful for the sake of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. God feeds us with the presence of Jesus Christ. I'm going to take a moment at this time. If you have not received, uh, if you'd like to, this is uh, bread and grape juice. And some of you are going to be the usher and take these around. This council president kind of got sent. Those of you at home, if you do have communion elements, you're welcome to use those at this time. If you do not have the elements or if you're not able to eat and drink, that's okay. We also receive the word of God as communion itself. Just a reminder, if you have one of the communion packets, it is grape juice and bread. Thank you very much, Chris. Thanks for your willingness, Roger. Jesus commands us to remember him as we have this communion. We eat together at the table. We eat believing that this meal remains powerful, that the meal reconciles, if only for a moment, all of God's creation, revealing that without exception, we are members of one body, the body of Christ in endless diversity. Here at the table sharing food, we are brought into the ongoing work of making creation whole. So please join me in the prayers of thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks and gave it for all to drink saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. Please do not yet eat these. Let's first gather together as one by the Holy Spirit. We pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I do invite you to take the bread. The body of Christ is given for you. And the juice, the blood of Christ is shed for you. As we allow this to nourish our body, please listen as Hanbin and Esther Co. play You Are My All in All.
It's a beautiful image as we throw away the leftovers from taking communion. Isn't that what happens to our sinfulness? Isn't that what happens to our brokenness? Christ takes it, it's thrown away, removed from us, and we're given new life and new cleansing. Thanks for doing that, Roger. Let us pray together. Oh God, we give you thanks that you have set before us this feast, the body and blood of your son. By your spirit, strengthen us to serve all in need and to give ourselves away as bread for the hungry. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thankfully, we are a congregation who has people that are taking communion to those that are at home. We ask God's blessing on these communion kits and all the communion that is shared beyond these walls. Gracious God, loving all your family with a mother's tender care, you sent the angel to feed Elijah with heavenly bread. Assist those who set forth to share your word and sacrament with those who are sick, homebound, and imprisoned. In your love and care, nourish and strengthen those who will receive the sacrament. Lord God, we ask that you will also protect, embrace, and fill all those who will receive these prayer shawls with your love, with your fullness. Please continue to give all the comfort of your abiding presence through the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We are almost done. This is the sending part. God blesses us and sends us in mission to the world. The part inside the walls is done, but the rest of our living, our faith is just beginning. The hymn is 778, The Lord's My Shepherd, 778 in Evangelical Lutheran Worship, verses 1 and 2.
In the light of Christ, let us lead us and stay lit in our lives today. May the God of hope fill us with all joy and peace in believing so that we may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit through the new life given to us in Christ Jesus. Amen. Our postlude, I encourage you to be quiet as you can for meditation is Vesper Chimes. together for worship. Just a reminder, we do continue to have worship in person and virtually Saturday at 6 p.m., Sunday at 9, as you know. Uh, the new series on King David starts today following worship. Matthew Family has that set up, and it is going to be fabulous, so please do stay as you're able to do that. Uh, just a reminder, now that we are in Lent all the way with both feet, uh, there is worship on Wednesdays. Wednesday morning at 11, both in person and on Zoom. We have Holden Evening Prayer, which is good all times of the day, in my opinion. Uh, and also 7 p.m., we are now hosted at Zion ER every Wednesday night, 7 p.m. Mass are optional there. Um, so we will be trying to, uh, to show that on Zoom. It will also be on Facebook for folks that have Facebook at Zion ER's uh, Facebook page. Uh, just a couple things going on in light of the fact that uh, there is war happening in Ukraine. There is a peace vigil today at 4 o'clock, hopefully after some of the heaviest of the rains. Uh, that's going to be at Calvary United Methodist Church on Center Avenue. If you choose to participate, that's at 4 o'clock. I can give you more details if you'd like. Uh, if people would like to participate helping, there are quite a few disasters going on in addition to that one. So if you'd like to contribute with your disaster relief is one way uh, to participate. And if you're interested in getting a little more hands-on, uh, I just learned that there is a family from Afghanistan, these were people that assisted the U.S. Uh, during our war in Afghanistan. A family is being resettled here in Berks County, and there are a number of churches, including Lutheran churches, that are trying to get people and finances and household goods and help that family um, to resettle and to put down their roots in this area. If you're interested in that, I'll be glad to share that information as well. There's a little switch. Walter Singletary is going to be back this next week already. Uh, he and Beth were able to, to create, so thank you for doing that, Beth. So Walter will be with us leading worship next Sunday. Uh, other than that, I think things are pretty much all the same. Please continue to look in your newsletter. And please continue to watch the announcements uh, for meetings and events happening around the church. Anything I missed while we're still recording? And go in peace and serve the Lord. Just a reminder, daylight savings time next weekend. Thank you. I shouldn't have my back to the announcements, should I? It's okay. <laughs> Kathy, where would you like to meet? Can we up here? Yeah, sure. Okay. <laughs> 
about David in the Bible and trying to squish this all down and, and make it into a good tight like four week thing wasn't happening. It'll be seven weeks. That's one. So seems like a good fit. And um, yeah, so we'll we'll kind of feel through. I do have all of it done, but it's not done done. Like each week I'll go back and, and review. Um, so it's a lot that's put together. If you think it gets to be too much and too overwhelming, you have to talk to me and give me feedback, and we'll make changes as we can. So we're looking at first and second Samuel. Um, and it starts kind of in the middle of everything because if we don't know a little bit about Saul, then we don't know like where David's going. So that's what we're going to be working with. And I would encourage you to bring Bibles. I know all of our books here are put away with COVID, um, but you don't have to. And for today, I'll read. We are also not going to read the entire chapters of what we're going to cover each uh, week that we need. So I'll tell you ahead of time what it is we're going to do for the following week. In case you want to read it ahead and just get a, a heads up on what's happening, but it's not homework. So, so if you don't want to read it, that's okay too. You can show up and it's all good. All right. Okay, so let's go to the second slide, please. Um, it, well, Greg told me to just move the mouse on the, the desk, but I wasn't figuring out how to move it. So, you know, Kathy, Mary Lou, and Phil Klein are online. Hi, Mary Lou. Hi, Phil. I can pull this up on mine too. Can I move it on yours? Keep smiling, guys. <laughs> is there um, is there a presentation mode that you don't see the the other slides? Where where is that? Is that this? Um, maybe. All right, well, we can start with this. You tell me, what do you already know about David? Judah, Israel. Ah, King of Judah and Israel. What else can I I'm just going to repeat so that what Herod and Herod is talking about. He killed Goliath. He killed Goliath. He was a shepherd. Songs. The Psalms. Yeah, ah, the story of Bathsheba. Remember that one? He didn't just have the right kill, but there was a reason why he had that killed. And you all know that you just don't want to say it was from church. But no, we're gonna have to just say it. So, okay. We're allowed to talk about real life at church, by the way. Just to say it. 
Okay, so I wrote some stuff down, and actually I had that set up like that it would pop up, but that's not going to happen. So, so here are some things that I came up with, uh, that he played the harp and wrote music. We talked about that with Psalms, uh, that he was the king of Judah and Israel, that he loves God, um, that he is a shepherd boy, he was, is, uh, that Shiva, the warrior, uh, he kills the lion. So, so we do know a whole lot already. And his life is so vast that when I think about them turning that into a presentation of sight and sound, I just don't want to pick out. You know, because there's so much it's there. And uh, so, so we'll look and we'll pick out what we think is, what I think is important. Uh, actually, not just I, but at the end, I'll give you the reference material that I'm using. And if you're in a you can get it and read that stuff because I just kind of summarized that and drew other sources and threw it all together. Okay, so some fast facts. Can we go to the next slide? Yeah, I was still trying to get it big for you. Okay. So we know that David, David, the word, when you spell it in Hebrew, it's D W D. Of course, it doesn't look like that because people are doing it. But it means to love. David is well beloved. And uh, he was the youngest son of Jesse. You remember that? Okay, so we'll get to that story today, actually. And maybe he lived in the year 1010 to 970 BCE, but we don't know for sure. And David's life with historians gets complicated and controversial because they're, when you go back 10, 15 years, there are historians who say David did not exist. This was not a person. There is no archaeological uh, sources to support it. And then within the last like 10, 15 years, sources have been found that support that there was a King David, that there was a Solomon, that the, you know that this was all there and good. So, so just keep that in mind. Ch the, we know these children, and there are probably quite a few more that we don't know because David was a king, and monogamy was not with the standard at the time. So he at least had Amna, Absalom, Tamar, Adonijah, Solomon, Nathan, and at least 13 others. If it wasn't all one wife, it was a lot. You know, I, I think about like, we just did Moses not too long ago, right? Um, and we did, we did Joseph. I think about all his brothers and all the different wives that, that contributed there. So, so yeah, we have all of that together. And... I can just click there. Can I click there? So there we go. We don't have the two chapters. That's okay. Sure. So that's great. If you went to, if you if you ran into David, see, I'm thinking when I go to heaven, I'm going to be able to talk to people who were already like hanging out. I want to see family, you know, but I, I want to see Jesus. I want to talk to him. I figure the line's going to be pretty long there. <laughs> and and I, I want to see Peter. Figure less of a line, maybe, maybe not. I want to see David. I really want to talk to David. So what are some, these are some questions that I want to ask him. Like, which stones did you pick? Why did you pick those stones? Like you, so you're bending down in the creek and you're picking up some stones and throwing them up. Like, how did you know? Um, how did you record your songs? And who heard them? Did you just sing them between you and God? I don't think so, because otherwise they wouldn't be here. So who got to hear the songs? And... You know, like, did you write them down? Did you call somebody in and say, yo, song time, sit, record? I want to know that. What would you change in your life? David did some, some things that we're proud of and some things that we're not proud of. That's why I love David, because he's like real. 
um, I want to know, like, you screwed up. Would you change that? Or was that like, okay, because you learned from it and you moved on? What do you want to know about David? What do you want to ask him when you see him? I'd like to ask him what was in his mind when he he did that whole thing with Bathsheba and Uriah, Uriah and how did he think that that was okay in any way whatsoever? Did he think he was so all powerful as king that he could just do as he pleased? Or, you know, what was going through his mind? I'd like to, I'd like to really know that. Good question. What else would you like to know? What do you want to ask David? I was curious when he wanted to build a temple and uh, was told, no, you can't. Every temple was mm -hmm. Anybody else? Because it's okay to just like sit around and listen to him talk. Maybe there'll be like seminars, you know, like when you go to a conference and you get to pick room A or room B. And, and you get to like hang out there. So I, I don't know exactly what's going to Yeah, Susie. When he was pulled out of the field, and you know, what, you know, what was in his mind then, you know, about, you know, coming, coming in Samuel and saying, you know, that, that he was, he was the next one in line. Because he certainly was modest and lived modestly and didn't have any thoughts about it being king I, I feel so, so. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah I would agree with that oh you know what I didn't do is offering do we need to should we do offering Chris can be the basket. They'll just assemble and, and any contributions that you would like to take care of. All right. Well, so I don't know that we're going to find out all of this now. I don't have the answers to my questions in this study that we're doing, but yeah, maybe we can figure some out or maybe we just wait. So we're going to have seven weeks and we're going to highlight uh, half of first Samuel and almost all of second Samuel. Um, so we're going to follow from when David was selected by Samuel up through his death. And there is more about David in first Kings. Uh, as well as first Chronicles, but we're not going into all of that. So if you want to find out more about that, your job there. And so my first thought was, let's take time and read 15, 16, 17, like break up into groups and then share, but that's going to take too long. So we're not going to do that, but, but that was a good intention. And I will tell you for next week, what you might want to read before we get together uh, to look at the next part. So for me, I want to know where things are happening. It gives me a better view. And that's why there's some maps in here. If maps don't work for you, ignore them. It's okay. Um, so David, Samuel, and Saul, who were they? We talked about David. We have a pretty good, like, roundabout with him. Who's Samuel? Prophet. Mm -hmm. And who is Saul? The king, right? This is the Saul who was king before David, not the Saul that's in the New Testament coming up later, right? Okay. And uh, why are these significant in our study? Well, David, uh, and how about Samuel? Okay. And how about Saul? Okay. 
All right. So Saul has some issues that come in here and maybe you can see some parallels in today's world. So obedience or not is the title of this part. And this is from 1 Samuel 15 verses 22 and 23. So you can see out of verses 15, 16, and 17, I'm taking little teeny tiny chunks that we're going to focus on because if we looked at the whole thing, it would take forever and we're, we're just not going to do that. So let me read this for you. And like I said, maybe in the weeks to come, you want to bring your own Bibles along. Nobody has to, but that way you can take care of that. I'm going to move over here so I can see. And we're looking at 22 and 23. So um, Saul did some things that uh, God didn't feel were appropriate. Two big things. One thing is uh, he was supposed to, okay, I don't remember the one. The, the one that I remember is he was supposed to go and kill all the Ammonites and everything that they had, all their cattle, everything. And so he went and he killed off almost everything except some of the cattle and the sheep. And Samuel goes and talks to him and he's like, um, you didn't do what you were supposed to do. And he's like, yeah, 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 we did. And he's like, so those cattle and sheep that I'm hearing, what's up with that? Well, you know, we thought we would bring those for sacrifice. And he's like, no, you didn't. And this is another mistake you made. So God is saying, you're not going to be king anymore. And Saul goes off and Samuel goes and, and neither of them are very happy about any of this. It's the last time Saul sees Samuel. Samuel is grieving and God comes to him and like shakes him and says, get up. I got a job for you. Go find a new king. And he's like, I really think this is a good job. Like this is not the time to do this because uh, Saul's around. And if I find a new king, then guess what? We're both in trouble, the new king and me. Um, and he just kind of like left that go. But uh, he did. He went and he went to Jesse because that's to whom he was supposed to go. And all of the brothers come parading in front of him. And um, Saul says, uh, Samuel says to Jesse, is this it? Um, no, nah, there's another one. The, the youngest one is out with the sheep. Like, well, get him, bring him in here. So let me read here. Uh, let me back up just a little bit. I'll go to 20. But I did obey the Lord, Saul said. I went on mission. The Lord assigned me. I completely destroyed the Amalekites and brought back Agog, their king. The soldiers took sheep and the soldiers, not him. The soldiers took sheep and cattle from the plunder. The best of what was devised, uh, devoted to God in order to sacrifice them to the Lord your God at Gilgad. But Samuel replied, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the voice of the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice. And to heed is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divination and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. And Saul said, yeah, I, I sinned, but, you know, so what? Um, so I, I said, I'm sorry. God will forgive me, Right. And, you know, he expected that, but that's not quite what happened. So in this part where Saul is rejected as king, was he being obedient? So if, if he didn't do it and the soldiers did, should he be accountable for it? Have you used the, the word crown? How about that? 
I think that was Shakespeare. <laughs> <laughs> or Chris Keller. <laughs> yeah, so there, there's rebellion in here. There's arrogance, you know, like, I didn't do this. They did it. And, and we didn't do this. You know, we're, we're bringing this for a sacrifice. You're right. <laughs> it sounds good. You know, like, were you ever caught doing something you weren't supposed to do? No? Nobody yeah. besides I? Yeah. <laughs> and, and what do you do? Do you fess up right away? Uh, yeah, I didn't. I would be like, um, let me think. Let me get a good answer here for you. Um, and, and that's what Saul's doing. And, he, you know, he finds some way in there. Um, when we rebel against God, what can we do when we're, like, caught face to face? Repent. Now, he says here that, God, I'm sorry, but God still rejects him. Why do you think that is? Does God not care if we repent? I think God knew his heart and didn't feel it was a sincere, a sincere, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, I think that's probably it. God can see the, the heart. And we see that coming out here in what I just read. And then again, when we get to Samuel selecting David rather than some of his older brothers who look like they should be selected. So, yeah, let's, let's keep that thought. Mm -hmm. uh, one is we're aware that COVID at this point spreads uh, our souls and breath since y'all have passed one. I'm, I'm comfortable passing out Bibles if, that, if you like the Bible. We've discovered that it doesn't hang out on paper, which was the original thought when it right. first happened. Yeah. Yeah. That'll be harder to stop singing after two verses. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, with God turning down the, the repentance, I wonder if there's still consequences even when we repent. The next part I want to look at is in First Samuel chapter sixteen, verses three through twelve. And you guys have Bibles. Mm -hmm. So is there anybody who would like to read that? Yeah, it's hard to see there, but but you can like move around if you want. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I'll show you what to do. You shall anoint for me the one whom I named you. Then the did the Lord commanded the king of Bethlehem. He always the see the king of the weak and trembled, and he said, Do you come recently? He said, Recently I've come to sacrifice the Lord. By yourselves and come with me to sacrifice. Sanctify Jesse and son to invite them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Gilead and thought, Surely the Lord of the is not for the Lord. The Lord said to Samuel, Not look on his appearance, but on the height of his stature, because I've rejected him. The Lord does not see as mortals see, they look at outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And Jesse called to him and made him pass before Samuel. He said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. And Jesse said, Shema, pass by. And he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen any of you. Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he remains just the youngest of these keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send him for the last to God until he comes. And he sent the frog, and now he was ruddy and had people with eyes and his hands. The Lord said, Rise and run him, for this is the one. Thank you. Ruddy. What is that? 
I don't know. What, what does ruddy mean? Ruddy is, I think, reddish, like from, from weathering. You know, he was, he was vital. He was out with the sheep and he developed a tan and, and a reddish complexion. So absolutely, that could be one of the answers. Uh, another one that the author that in one of the books I was using said maybe he had reddish hair. Oh, okay. um, it, sunburn, just like dark complected. Don't know. Don't know. But, but, you know, like that comes up again later on. And it's like, I just Googled it. Yes. And what does Mr. Google say? It says, of a person's face having a healthy white color. Cheerful pipes from the end of white complexion. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Google. So what is what kind of discernment are we looking at and what was just read? So what does Samuel have to know? He used to know what God is, what God's what God's opinion is of these young man he's looking at. Yeah, absolutely. He sees the first son, Eliab. Eliab, is that his name? Yeah. And he's, he's like, ooh, <laughs> this is a kingly person. And he's ready to go. And God's like, nope. Not. And he has to be listening to God at the time because he's all ready to go jump on it. And God stops him. What if he had like anointed this one king and just didn't listen? Because we'll hear him coming up shortly in another part. And his choices are, are just not quite right. Uh, Iliad also is one of God. So his name is even a godly kind of name. There we go. So it, it seems right, Good doesn't it? <laughs> I, I have here, what can we learn by listening to God's voice? But I think a better question is, how do you listen to God's voice? Pardon me? With an open heart. With an open heart. When do you take time to listen to God? Like for real, not a like spiritual, like I'm in church, this is the right answer thing. When, when do you like seek out God? How do you do that? Where do you go? What do you do? And it's quiet. You have a quiet moment. Sometimes I sit on the back porch in the summer. That's quite the thing. Mm -hmm. With, you know, a nice breeze blowing in it and there's no noise in there. Some people say it's when they look for dogs. For me, it's when I'm outside and quiet, as Jean said. Sometimes it's when I first wake up in the morning before I have a lot of stuff, right? So, so I'd like you to just keep that thought in mind through the week and see, you know, like when do you actively see God? And, you know, like if you have a prayer time, like, so not in this Bible, but in a book that I have at home, a devotional book, I have a little sticky tab that has names on it for like a prayer list. I don't know that I always listen when I'm going through my list. Do you know what I mean? Um, and I, I want to take time to listen to God. That's part of what I, I want to do in this Lenten time. I don't want to give up because I like candy. What? <laughs> <laughs> but I want to add. So I just want to add that like um, reflective time. Not like, so I have my, my devotional time in the morning. 
read book one, read book two, read book three, read this. And okay, that's done. Now I have to go take care of the dog and I have to, you know, do this. And, and where is the time that I'm going to put aside to try to hear? So that, that's my thing. You don't have to do that. But I want you to think about it through the week and how we listen to God's voice. Holy Spirit. First Samuel 16, 13 says, so Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in presence of his brothers, in the presence of his brothers. Think what would have happened with Joseph. <laughs> and from that day on, the Holy Spirit came upon David in power. Samuel then went to Ramah. All right. Why does David anoint? Why does Samuel anoint David? Okay, so he's the chosen one. And then my question is, why is the Holy Spirit coming on David important? The Holy Spirit was with Saul when he was anointed, but when God rejected him, he pulled the Holy Spirit away from him. Now that leads to a whole other set of questions. If you screw up, is God going to take the Holy Spirit away from you? Is he going to reject you? How bad do you have to screw up before this happens? And we're not going into that in this. <laughs> <laughs> but we can, we can answer that from a Christian perspective. After Jesus, this is still right. David is like the first Messiah in a way, the first anointed one. Uh, because he came uh, following through the prophecies. But when we have baptism, we're promised that we're sealed by the Holy Spirit forever. But something that cannot be taken away from Jesus is the advocate. And so, well, I think that can be a difference from the Old Testament and the promise after the coming of the Messiah is a difference. Thank you. So we do have the promise and we have the hope and we have, you know, but, but we still need to go through Jesus and his blood to get us there. And, and that's, of course, the last question that I put on the slide. So how does that parallel with Jesus and, you know, his blood directing us as we go? I point out that it looks like the picture that you found does have Oops. as he's being anointed. He's looking a little less arrow. I think he would have looked quite arrow. Yeah, indeed. So maybe they didn't see Mr. Google. Maybe they were so <laughs> Well, and we're looking at paintings from quite a while ago. So keep that thought in mind. Also, like artwork, just keep that in mind as we look at the Ukraine. I mean, there's museums over there that, um, you know, they have artwork in and it's... I, that's not the most important thing, perhaps, to protect, but it's surely something that needs to be thought about. God's arrangements. So in 1 Samuel 16, 14 through 23, we'll take a, I'll, I'll read through that for you, and we'll take a real quick look at that, because I do want to get to the next part yet, and I know that you don't want to be here forever, so all good. Now, the spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. Saul's attendants said to him, see, an evil spirit from God is tormenting you. Let our Lord command his servants here to search for someone who can play the harp. He will play when the evil spirit from God comes upon you, and you will feel better. So God said to his attendants, find someone who plays well and bring him to me. One of the servants answered, I have seen a son of Jesse of Bethlehem who knows how to play the harp. He's a brave man and a warrior. He speaks well and is a fine looking young man. 
The Lord is with him. Ah, uh, yeah. But they don't know the whole story. Then David sent, then Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, send me your son, David, who is with the sheep. So Jesse took a donkey loaded with bread and a skin of wine and a young goat and sent them with his son, David, to Saul. He, Saul didn't ask for all that other stuff. He asked for David. But Jesse sent it all anyway. David came to Saul and entered, in, entered his service. Saul liked him very much, and David became one of his armor bearers. Then Saul sent word to Jesse, saying, Allow David to remain in my service, for I am pleased with him. Whenever the Spirit from God came upon Saul, David would take his heart and play. Then relief would come to Saul. He would feel better, and the Spirit would leave him. Now, notice in here, it doesn't say, like, God said to Saul, this is the next king. But it was set up for that, right? So two parts here. From Saul's point of view, why is David come to him? Yeah, he feels better. Spirit of God leaves him, evil spirits attack him, play some music, feel good. What about God's viewpoint? It was like an apprenticeship almost. <laughs> it was. Saul didn't see it that way. Probably a good thing. Yeah. So, and he kind of like gets to sit back and watch how everything's gone in the court. Uh, how does Saul manage this? Uh, what, what's happening here? Um, so the question is, what does God want David to do here? I think he wants him to learn and, and feel comfortable in the surroundings and, 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 be, and, and, and also to be, you know, a support to Saul you know, in that, in that way. Yeah. Armor bearer, one of the armor bearers. Did you catch that? He is not the only one who like when Saul goes somewhere is like dragging all the stuff with him. I, Saul may not even know who this kid is. It's just like, yo, park guy, get him. I need him now. Okay. Away. How about armor bearers? Let's go, all 50 of you. So keeping that in mind, because that question comes up then later with, what do you mean you don't know who this kid is? And we're going to take a real quick look at David and Goliath. Yes. Did you say that Saul loved David in verse 21? So I'm wondering if maybe he didn't kind of I totally, again, agree with the point that there are a lot of people around. It does seem that they build a pretty tight relationship and I'm wondering if that starts already. Yeah. Uh, really. mm -hmm. I was also intrigued uh, with, with your reading and your translation uh, at the, in, the, in the last verse 23. Did it say evil spirit or did it say spirit in your translation? Spirit. It was our translation that has evil spirit each time. That evil spirit on uh, Saul. Uh, and then David was chasing that evil spirit away. And, and it does say that, I think, at the beginning, that an evil spirit came and let's get somebody to play. But it doesn't say that down here in 23. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So we've got David and Saul together. And then something else comes up. And you don't see, you see a, a questioning here. So we'll get to that in a minute and we'll try and figure that out. But here's David and Goliath. We all know the story, right? So what do we know? What happens? Picked up a rock, killed the giant. Okay. Giant was terrorizing everybody else. Giant was terrorizing everybody else. Okay. Goliath was not the only giant. Ah, Goliath was not the only giant. 
Hmm. But he was but a very were, boisterous one. Big people. This, the Philistines yeah. were big people. Yes. Well, no, not all of them, but there apparently uh, there were a group of tall, very tall, very big men, women, I don't know about women, it just focused on men with what I read, in that area, like over nine feet. Oh, what? Over nine feet? Yeah, yeah. Wow. So, and this is one of them who was with Philistines and came out and he's like, no, here I am. Uh, get me, if you can. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, in the maps that you see, you have maybe where this happened, but it, it this is pretty like set with where it would have happened because it's in a valley and it's a dry time. And this is where the armies would have come together to fight each other because it was an open plain and, and a good place for war, apparently. How about that? Yeah. 17, just four verses, 26 through 30. Anybody want to read that one? I'll read it. Thanks, Susie. 26 through 30. Okay. David said to the men who stood by him, what shall be done for the man who kills the Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is the uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? The people answered him in the same way. So shall it be done for the man who kills him. His eldest brother Eliab heard him talking to the men and Eliab's anger was kindled against David. He said, why have you come down? With whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your presumption and the evil of your heart for you have come down just to see the battle. David said, what have I done now? It was only a question. He turned away from him toward another and spoke in the same way, for the people answered him again as before. So his older brother is like, what are you doing here? Now, what was he doing there? Why did David come down? Was he there just to see the battle? Yeah, so he's feeding them. The army doesn't have food. The families have to send somebody in with food to give to the the families who are fighting. And David's bringing food in. And he happens to hear Goliath spouting out. And he's like, oh, nobody's going to shut this guy up. (laughs) And his older brother says, what is wrong with you? Just shut up. You just came down here to watch a battle. And now you're trying to instigate people to go fight. Uh, And David's like, is is this great? A great answer from David. Doesn't it sound like something that you would say or one of your kids would say if you have kids and they're coming to you and and you're saying like, you know, don't do this. And they're like, now what have I done? (laughs) Can I even speak? Wouldn't you say that? Mm -hmm. Would your kids say that? Of course. I I love it. David's real. (laughs) And yeah, so why is he so upset with Goliath? He's kind of speaking against God. God's army is basically dividing them and yeah yeah like you guys can't do anything and you know and and why is he live angry with david well we just talked about that and david says to saul with the, which i think you know but if you don't you can go back and you can read this then at home he's let me fight him i can get him i can kill him i killed a lion I killed a bear while I was taking care of the sheep. I can do this. And I I just wanted you to know there are no bears and lions now, but there were. And when they were, a Persian lion weighed 350 to 420 pounds. 
and a brown bear weighed 220 to 660 pounds. So even if he just killed a little one, that's the that's same pretty much, you know? Um, but they do. Couple quick verses. Who can read 34 to 37? Thank you. But David said to Saul, Your servant needs to keep sheep for his father. And remember a lion or a bear came and took a lamb for his flock. I went after it and struck it down. That's being a lamb in its mouth. If it turned against me, I will catch it by the jaw, strike it down the throat. Your servant has killed both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, since he has defied the army of the living God. David said, the Lord who saved me from the fall of the lion and from the fall of the bear will save me from the hand of the force. Paul said to David, go, oh, may the Lord be with you. <laughs> this is a kid. Yeah. He's telling you he killed a lion and a bear. And you said, how about it? What do you think? Do you think it's because Saul has faith in God that this is going to be taken care of through David? No, I think he's just happy someone was willing to go out. It's not him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. nothing less. <clears throat> what do you think would happen if David were killed? What was that? So it's yeah, so I would stay there. Would they surrender? See, I'm thinking that maybe it would be an incentive for the for Saul's army. Like, oh, they killed that little kid. Let's go fight instead of just standing here doing nothing. But maybe not, you know, maybe I'm just being. Yeah. I don't know that, in my opinion. I don't know that Saul was like, yeah, God's going to work through David. I think it was just like, well, we've got an option here, and it might work out to the good one way or the other. Don't know. Saul so, was pretty focused on himself, but I think it's important to remember he also has that evil spirit, which we might say is a, a mental illness for us. Sometimes that can really calm how Saul was perceiving people around him and the situation around him. Now he does try and help. He gives David all his armor, dresses him all up. Here, take all of this. And and David's like, I can't move. <laughs> this is not gonna work. I am so sorry, but no, nah, I don't think so. Um, and he undresses and he's in his regular stuff and he takes, you know, his like slingshot thing and stones. As he's walking out, he stops the creek, picks up some stones, puts them in his little like it's by his side and goes up and they start laughing at him. Everybody starts laughing at him. Verse 47 says, all those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. You know, so, you know, you, you, I'm, as I'm working with this, I'm thinking like Saul and Goliath and the Ukraine and, and Moscow or, you know, the whole uh, Russia. And, you know, I'm thinking like, come on, come on, God. Like we had this happen before, uh, you know, our God's hand was in it. And David recognized that he was giving honor to God before anything happened. And God honored that. Um, I'm not saying, I, I don't know where that goes. I don't know if the Ukraine is seeking God in this. I don't know if 
Russia is seeking God in this. I'm thinking not, but but my opinion. Um, yeah. Yes. Right. Right. Uh, it was agreed this morning that the Pope sent two cardinals to the Ukraine, uh, which was an unheard of action looking for uh, peace seeking peace support. Nice. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see how that plays out as uh, both Ukrainian and Russian Orthodox churches have been praying together and cooperating together. Uh, I think that's, that's a positive statement by the churches. There's something bigger going on. Outstanding. David says the battle is the Lord's. Have you heard that before? Have you said that before? Have you ever come to a wall that you just can't get past and you're like, not my battle. All yours bad. Have you been there? Not, not so nobly though. <laughs> this is too hard. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, God, that one's yours because I can't do it. Yeah, yeah. I suspect this was much more noble. So, and and that kind of leads into the next question: with how do we avoid God is on my side versus I'm going God's side? Is there a difference? I'm seeing heads nod. Anybody want to share what you think is a difference there? I, I feel like God is on my side. It's sort of a, an arrogant way to put it. Whereas I'm on God's side to me is giving yourself up more. That, <clears throat> I guess that you could switch it around too, I think maybe, you know, but I think there is a Yeah, and uh, think about the Crusades. Right. I'm on God's side. I'm going to like take care of things, or God is on my side. God will surely give victory because yeah. look at these infidels who are taking over. So, yeah. Your personal takeaway. Um, I would recommend you know if you get a chance and you can read through all of this do you know how the story ends right he hits him knocks him out he cuts off his head with his sword usually we don't get to that in like sunday school classes it's not really highlighted but i just wanted to let you know that happens so he takes his sword and he chops off his head and he carries it around and saul calls and says who who is that who killed that? And he, now he had him in his like tent or wherever with him and he dresses him up in armor. So, you know, here that that's that question of how does he not know who it is? He played the liar for him. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, you know, maybe it's that spirit that like gets him confused. Don't know. I don't have an answer for that for you, but it was one of the things in my mind, like seriously, how can you not know? But but so David comes hoofing in, carrying Saul's head and sword. And it's like, this is a good thing. You killed him. That's great. Good. I need you to work in my army. Let's go. And we go from there into the next chapters that are coming up. But, you know, is this just like a good story for... Sunday school kids, except for the like bloody head thing coming around, you know, or can you get some takeaways from here yourself? So take a look back at what's there. Think about that. And let's, I have a prayer before we do that next week, we're going to be looking at chapters 18 through 23. So if you want to look at those ahead of time, you're welcome to. If you don't, that's okay. We'll just be picking out a couple little verses and it won't take us long because we won't have the introductory part. Um, the sources that I used 
uh, overall. There's others besides this. But um, 16 Facts About King David from Overview Bible that's online, from uh, The Life of David that's also online, from the Bible study that's online, The Life of David, and then a book that I downloaded onto my Kindle. And that's called The Life of David, Discipleship Lessons from First and Second Samuel from Jesus Walk. And that's where the maps come from um, and, and a lot of the references that I'm using. So I wanted you to know that. Surely not because I know anything. Let's pray. Father, give us bold faith like the young David. So often we are motivated by our fears rather than by our faith. Forgive us for thinking so selfishly. Give us a broad vision for your purposes and your kingdom, and then make us warriors for you. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's pray that Mr. Putin finds somebody who plays the heart very well and can soothe him and maybe give him some direction. Sorry, that was my political thought for the day. Thanks, everybody. And we will come back to part two next week. I think we saw an apologize for the political Jesus was very political, but that part of Thank you. Oh, yeah, let's see if we can. Oh, nuts. So I got kicked off of Zoom. Thank you, Chris. So my computer got kicked off, but it kept working. Well, that's really strange. Huh. So God is on your side. <laughs> well, so apparently I will send that to you each week because uh, Craig didn't know because mine is not uh, Macintosh and Apple. And we do have a dog in there, but he didn't have a dog like that in the face at all. Um, I mean, he moved into a flash drive. The keynote